Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Dead Man, a four-issue miniseries published by DC Comics in 1986. The writer for this is Andrew Helfer, who is an editor all throughout the 80s at DC, but he also wrote uh, quite a few uh, comics. Um, I think the longest run he did was on the Shadow comic that... Uh, followed the Howard Chicken Shadow miniseries. I remember liking that a lot as a teenager. Um, I remember liking this comic as a teenager, not as much, but I did like the art. So, um, eh, I don't know. I, I don't know about Andrew Helfer, but it's neither here nor there because the real star of the show, this comic is written, I'm sorry, is penciled and inked by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. The great comic book artist, uh, born in Spain, lived most of his life in Argentina, then came to America, and uh, pretty much by the early 70s started working for DC exclusively. And he is one of the best, like, mainstream superhero type comic artists, I think, ever. He's so good. And he really goes to town on this. And he does ink himself, which is, it's, he didn't do that all the time. But um, he uses a lot of techniques. And it's like you could tell he was excited about this project. Like there's tons of zip -a tone and crazy shading and just uh, tons of panels in every page. It's like he's really uh, putting the work in. So let's uh, check these out. Number one here, beautiful cover. Garcia Lopez was so good at uh, just doing like the perfect body language or a pose, you know, of a character. In fact, he was the guy who drew all the style guides, at least for like 20 years at DC. You know, like, so if someone wanted, wanted to make a Superman backpack and have an image of Superman, they'd have him draw it because he drew so appealingly and like perfect, you know. You know, they wanted his art to represent the DC superheroes. So around this time, DC had published... Uh, Seven issue miniseries, kind of deluxe on Baxter paper, reprinting all of the original Neil Adams Dead Man. I guess they sold pretty well. So this miniseries was uh, put into production. Um, Andrew Helfer, the writer, decided to just continue from there, even though those were basically published uh, 15 years before. And, and there's been many Dead Man stories since then. But he's almost like pretending that stuff didn't happen. And he's just starting from where the late 60s series ended. So it's a very in medias rest. It's like, what the hell's going on? Batman's barging through a door. We see uh, Boston Brand, our hero. And uh, he's been convalescing. He's obviously been injured. He's in like a, a hospital gown. His brother Cleveland is there. They're twins. And Batman's basically saying, hey, you got to recuperate. You can't leave. He's like, fuck you. <laughs> I want my dead man outfit. So Batman opens this locked cabinet. and You know, there's his dead man outfit. As they walk out into the streets, they're in this uh, kind of mystical city called Nanda Parabat. It's almost like Kunlun or Shangri-La, you know. Somewhere, I think, in the Himalayas, hidden from the rest of the world. Um... Uh, it's kind of a home base for Dead Man. He uh, usually, he almost in so, a lot of the stories, he'd always come back to Nanda Parabat, even though mostly he lived in like the Western world. But uh, this is kind of his home base. And uh, I love this two page spread, just showing all the people who live in Nanda Parabat. This guy's smoking a hookah or something. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing. But uh, just really well observed, all these characters doing various little tasks. Even the mountains are gorgeous here with the, like, the shading. Such a good illustrator. So before he leaves, Dead Man wants to confront Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna is like a goddess who's in control of Nanda Parabat. And I think she founded it. And he basically wants to say, like, let her know what's up. I was, he's out of there. There she is. Basically, he says, you know, I've been serving you for years, fighting evil, being your avatar. I want a little time off to take care of some business back in the back in the States. Look at this crazy op art here. It's a uh, I think they call that overprinting. 
I can't remember, but um, the colorist on this is Tom Ziuko, by the way. He uh, did a lot of comics for DC. He colored a lot of comics. Pretty nice colors. I think this is on that Mando paper. That was like a better quality paper and it held color better because the colors are very solid throughout this comic. So Ram, they do all kinds of cool effects whenever they show Ramakrishna. It's kind of kind of neat. More of that op art. And I love the way he draws Ramakrishna. He draws such beautiful women. Seems to be a thing Spanish artists do. Like Esteban Morado draws luscious women and uh, Victor de la Fuente. All those guys, they seem to... They just are really beautiful women. So they leave the city. And uh, as soon as they leave the city, Dead Man returns to his ghostly self. If you've never read Dead Man... He's kind of this weird superhero who, he's a ghost. Nobody can hear him, nobody can see him, but he can enter people and take over their bodies, like use them like a meat puppet, you know? And that's how he fights evil. So Cleveland and Batman get uh, get onto this plane and they, uh, they're heading back to America. Meanwhile, we see down in the snow, this is the Sensei. He's the big villain of the piece. And uh, we'll find find out more about him later. <laughs> really nice drawings there. God, I love that. I should also point out, he has a lot of like 12 panel pages like this. Just definitely giving you a bang for your buck. So now we're back at the circus. Uh, Boston Brand was a circus performer. That was his job. And... Um, Cleveland's walking around the circus. He's there too, wearing the dead man outfit because they're twins. So uh, he's kind of pretending to be, well, I'm sorry, he's not pretending to be Boston, but uh, I think he's going to take over the act or something. He sees these two robbers leave the office. They, they just robbed it. And dead man shows up and he enters one of the guy's bodies, makes him dance and sing like a madman, and then conks his friend on the head and knocks him out. Obviously, dead man. Whenever dead man possesses someone, there's this little yellow aura around them. That's how you can tell. And then he walks over to Cleveland, hands him the gun, and says, here, hit me on the bean now and knock me out. And as soon as he does, dead man leaves the body. And everyone thinks Cleveland's a hero. He doesn't even remember what happened. So, um, I guess Cleveland doesn't even know how his brother became dead man. So he basically takes over his brother that night and it's almost like he has a blackout. And when he looks down, there's this uh, bunch of papers that, uh, he wrote because that's the only way he can communicate with someone who's alive. So he wrote down his origin story. So we see, uh, Boston brand back when he was an aerialist, he, wore this costume already. That was his, like, circus act uniform. Look at this body language here. This is, he's just so good. Just drawing these really dynamic poses and stuff. And one night while he was performing his act, a shot rang out, and he was murdered while in flight. And he fell to his death. When he, like, wakes up kind of in the land of the dead, you know, And that's the first time he met Ramakrishna. And she basically said, um, I want you to be my avatar against evil. You'll, you'll get to be this ghost guy who can enter other people's bodies. So the first thing he wants to do, though, is find the guy who killed him. And it's this guy, the hook, some hitman. It turns out, though, he's working for this guy, for the sensei. The sensei is kind of this uh, mastermind who's got like a league of assassins. Before he can uh, get to the hook, the sensei kills him. For some reason, he thought that he failed in the mission. Another beautiful Ramakrishna there. And then uh, after, you know, he finishes the origin story, Boston asks his brother, he says, Hey, can I ask you a huge favor? Could I enter your body for like a few days or a week so I could do some stuff, talk to people? And, and some other things that only a human can do. 
He talks to the circus strongman, Tiny. He's a simple-minded, sweet guy. He wants him to know that, you know, he's not quite dead. He lives somewhere, you know. He goes to visit his ex-girlfriend, of course. Now that he's got a body, he's like, oh yeah. I'm surprised he didn't do that first. He even visits his own grave and standing at the grave is Vashnu. He's like the circus mystic. And he knows all about Landa Parabat and Ramakrishna. So Boston uh, just kind of to be selfish. She's just like, I really want to do this one thing. I want to perform again in front of an audience, feel that thrill. I want no net because it's not as exciting and thrilling for the audience when there's a net under the trapeze, you know? So uh, Cleveland trains for a week. And with Boston guiding him, he's pretty damn good. So he does it. He uh, hears the crowd gasp in anticipation. <laughs> and this is crazy. As soon as he starts his act, a shot rings out. And somebody shoots him again. It's almost like the same pose. These are all great poses, by the way. I love this. This is very Gil Kane. Look at all the faces of the crowd looking up in astonishment. Floating heads. Kind of nice. And once again, well, not, it's Cleveland falls to his death. Dead man's just inside of him. Once again, some really interesting shading stuff, zip tone type stuff. And then Cleveland and Boston are in the afterlife here, like some kind of void. Tom Zico does some kind of weird coloring. And of course, Cleveland is pissed off. He's like, I loaned you my body for one week. You fucking got me shot, you motherfucker. He's punching him. But then all of a sudden, this vortex starts sucking on him. Starts drawing him in. And he's like, it's not, fu it's not fair. It should have been you. And Dead Man's like, he's right. So he calls out to Ramakrishna. And he says, let it be me. You know, basically, the, the vortex wants one soul, I guess. And... I'll take his place. So I guess that works. And the dead man heads towards the vortex. But as he's going, Cleveland's having a change of heart. And uh, he's like, wait, no, maybe I should have gone. And then we see a cutaway of to the Boston brand to Boston brand's gravestone. And meanwhile, dead man's getting closer and closer to some kind of light. And then guys, hold on to your hats. It's one of my favorite pages in a Marvel, a Marvel slash DC type comic. Look at that. So I guess he came back into his own body, which is now kind of like a zombie, but he can't hear anything. He can't see anything. He's trapped in this for all eternity. It's like a living hell. And look at this, just, I hope you can see this okay. This, I don't know how they do this, this, uh, but it's all this art, but it's like kind of, the colorist did it, or I don't know what it is, but like overprinting, but it's amazing. And look at all the detail here, the shading. And just a stance is so perfect. Oh man, I love that. I need a poster of that on my wall. Okay, number two. So uh, Cleveland is still in this void and he's talking to Rama, another beautiful Rama there. There's a, there's a panel. Kind of reminds me of the shading in a Howard Chaykin's American flag, that weird stippling. And so Cleveland basically flies or floats towards uh, his brother. And right when he's about to get sucked up, he grabs his foot and yanks him back. And uh, Dead Man is saying, never thought it could be so cold. Like it did not look like he was in for a good time. So Rama basically affords Cleveland that he, for some reason his soul is untainted. So if you go into the void, it won't be this horrible thing. It'll kind of be like a blissful heaven type thing, you know, eternal rest. But Dead Man, for some reason, 
something's maybe because he died already that uh it would be like an unending torture for all eternity so cleveland's like it's okay brother uh, i'm going because rama says it's not gonna be that bad really nice so now we're back in reality and you know he just got shot i guess that all happened in a microsecond So dead man's uh, ghost form, you know, just leaves. He's got nothing else. But he's 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 trying to find out who killed him this time. He's flying around, seeing if he can find the assassin. And he sees this woman, and he knows her. It's a Lotus. She's a resident of Nanda Parabat. He tries to possess her, but it doesn't work. She rejects him. And then all of a sudden, this guy Loomis shows up. He's the circus midget. And apparently, him and Lotus know each other. In fact, they used to be lovers. By their dialogue, we can tell. And uh, she thinks he's not going to hurt her. She's like, you, still, you could never betray me. You once loved me. He's like, wrong lady. She tries to shoot Loomis, but he's pretty formidable. He just like ducks out of the way, like really good acrobatic skills and then shoots her and kills her. And as she's dying, she says like, my destiny was for evil. It was something that could be forestalled, but never denied. Better to face it than live an eternal lie. Cause we'll talk more about this later, but apparently in Nanda Parabat, if you were evil on our earth, when you go there, it kind of sucks all the evil out of you. So everyone in Nanda Parabat is a good person, but they weren't always. In fact, most people there were really horrible people. But they were taken there and they kind of became domesticated, if you will. Just another great face. It's so good. This is like a sign of just how bad the writing is at some points in this. So he heard the whole conversation. He knows that Loomis just had to shoot the woman he loved. And he's like laughing, like kind of self-pitying, like, oh God, what a comedy of errors my life has become. This is ridiculous. Just like, ah, oh, it's so, it just rings so false. And it it's just bad characterization. So now Dead Man makes another vow to get the Sensei. So he goes to confront the, um, sorry, to confront Vashnu and Loomis is in his tent. So he jumps into Loomis's body. Loomis, they both seem to know he's there. They figured he'd show up. They're, they're like, come on in, dead man, so you can talk. And he has a tete-a-tete -tete with uh, Vashnu. I guess Sensai is planning to attack Nanda Parapet, like a final assault. I'm sorry, I've been saying it wrong the whole time. It's just Nanda Parbat. So Vashnu fills in Dead Man with the, the true origin of the Sensai. So I guess uh, Ramakrishna was one of the original gods, very powerful, but eventually more like warmongering gods got stronger and she got weaker. Her message was pretty much just of peace and love. So she kind of became a weaker god. So she sought out avatars to help her out in her battle against evil. And about a century ago, it looks like the old West, she found this guy named Jonah, who was a, dealt a horrible misfortune, like these evil men killed him. So when he died, Ramakrishna made him an offer. He says, you know, be my avatar. I'll give you the same powers that dead man has or would have. And he went around fighting evil for a century. And when he finds the evil people, he doesn't kill them. He brings them all to Nanda Parabat. So that's what I was saying. All these people in Nanda Parabat were pretty much the big, 
the worst people in the world. And now they're an end of Parabat and they're nice. I love this multi-handed thing they show for Ramakrishna when she gives commands. Very like Hindu goddess type thing. So um, after a century of service, he was like, basically just asked Ramakrishna to let him retire. He was just, he just wanted to pass on to the, you know, the big reward, the eternal rest. And she refused him. And so he becomes very bitter. And basically becomes rebellious and is, realizes that like, I gotta take her down. And uh, that's the only way maybe I could force her to give me my eternal rest. So he, at that time, took over the Sensai. The Sensai was a pretty bad guy already. He had a, a League of Assassins. But then Jonah entered his brain and uh, they got even more evil. So now basically uh, Loomis and Vashnu are on a plane heading to Nanda Parabat. Sorry, Parabat. But Dead Man decides to take a little detour and go visit the League of Assassins lair. It's somewhere in Asia, I think. And uh, he flies in there, you know. He's a ghost, so nobody knows. Or so we think. We see all these assassins training. He enters the body of one of them and just starts kicking everyone's ass. Really good at action, too. And then they wheel in this kind of like sci-fi gun. And, uh, you know, Dead Man's not even thinking about it. Nothing can affect him when he's a ghost. Or so he thought. Because they pull the trigger right on him. And he's affected. <laughs> and we'll find out what happens next issue. That's some crazy pyrotechnics there. Look at all that weird overprinting and just really nutty. Almost like a 3D comic or something. Okay, number three. Oh, I love this cover. That's just such a cool pose. So uh, the Sensei has him captured in this like stasis orb. So he's got some technology that can actually contain a ghost. I love this little recap two-pager. Just the way these panels kind of come out like they're coming out at you. That looks really, that's really nice design. So the sensei, or I should say Jonah, you know, is just being a villain, taunting dead man and telling him his plans, you know, typical James Bond shit. And then all of a sudden, these things come out and manacle the sensei's body and Jonah comes out so dead man can see him. So I guess the sensei, even though he's an evil bastard, he's a prisoner all this time. He's kind of been just a puppet for this guy. So this is a little looser, like that face, but it almost looks like a, a little Joe Kubert's uh, sneaking in here. So just a bunch of pages of this. Look at gloating. Uh, Jonah's gloating. And... But then uh, Dead Man figures out a way to escape. He taunts the soldier, so he kind of breaks the barrier with his gun, and Dead Man can escape. Man, that's a great face there. So many great pa faces and panels in here. I, I'm, I'm trying to refrain from just 
pointing out every panel because almost every panel I think is pretty damn good. So he makes his way out of the lair of the League of Assassins. He escapes. And now we're back in Nanda Parabat. Loomis is there. And we kind of get Loomis's backstory. And uh, I guess Loomis was a cop at one time. Before he became a circus performer. And uh, he, I guess when he was working for his dad's uh, security agency, he accidentally killed a, a mother and her son. So, you know, he was shamed, he felt guilty, and that's how he ended up in Nanda Parabat. To, you know, do penance, I guess, or whatever. Man, I really do like these, all these panels on a page. Look at this crazy layout here. It's all like shards. Oh, this one too. So, uh, outside the walls of Nanda Parabet, the Sensei's army shows up and they've got all kinds of crazy technology to, uh, so they can conquer Nanda Parabet. Dead Man finds out once again he can't enter the body of these League of Assassin guys. Any of them. And so he's close enough to Nanda Parabit now that he's solid again. That's what always happens. And so they just conk him on the head. They find him. The bad guys. And he wakes up in a little cell with Loomis. Oh man, such a good illustration. Such a master, this guy. And he looks out the jail cell window and he sees they've already won. They've already conquered the city. The bad guys. Okay, last issue, guys. This cover kind of bugs me just because there's pink. <laughs> it looks kind of silly. Pink and yellow. It's the main colors. So it turns out someone else is in the cell. That's Sensei. Now, of course, not under the control of Jonah. Jonah's out and about. Because, of course, Jonah is now solid as well, as well as Dead Man, because he's in Nanda Parabet. Really nice drawing there. He's a smug little bastard. I must feel sorry for the sensei, even though he's totally evil. So they've got dead man all chained up and they're about to shoot him, execute him. And he says, uh, he says almost everyone in Nanda Parabat is on this giant uh, plane and they're going to spread out throughout the world and spread their evil. Because I guess now that they've, now that They've left Nanda Parabat. They're just going to totally revert to their evil ways. He says he's going to kill all the children there. Because uh, they try to... Re Boston Brand tries to reason with him. He's like, they're innocents. They were never evil. They were born here. He doesn't care. He's pure evil, this guy. Oh, man. Look at that Ramakrishna. That's good. That too. So they're about to shoot dead man and all of a sudden Vashnu comes out of Rama's temple. He frees dead man and basically uh, takes the bullets for him. So they kill Vashnu. And so they all fire at Boston as he runs into the temple and he gets shot a bunch of times. So he's not doing good. Rama appears before him and says, take care of the children. He's like, I'd like to help Brahma, but I'm fading fast. Man, that's a that's so nice there. 
He's basically dying again. And so he goes to the edge of this, like, cliff that's, um, basically, it's just, like, almost goes to the center of the earth. Well, not that far, but it goes really deep into the earth, and he falls into this pit. And as he falls, I guess he's far enough from the surface, it's almost like being far from Nanda Parbat or outside. So he becomes a ghost creature again. His shackles fall off. And he's actually happily saying, I'm dead again. So Jonah puts on this like crazy rig, some special gun with an eyepiece that can like see, uh, you know, spiritual stuff. And he goes into the temple to confront Rama. They kind of have this, uh, you know, little uh, tete-a-tete. Basically, he's he's like, "This is you brought this on yourself. All you had to do was free me. And she tells him that she just didn't know how. She didn't even know that was possible then. It wasn't like she was just being cruel. So he hits her with this gun, and I guess this gun is some crazy special gun. Because she's a goddess, but it starts to burn her. And she's like, stop it, you're killing me. And he says, that's the idea, Rama. So the temple is shaking and crumbling. Everyone's outside just like, what the hell's going on in there? We don't know what to do. Loma looks over at Sensai. And he's got this evil, plant, you know, plotting look on his face. He's like, I better keep my eye on this guy. What's he up to? And Loomis vows to make sure the kids are going to be okay. So Dead Man uh, floats back up to the surface and it's totally painful as he becomes corporeal again. Um, you know, he's no longer a ghost. And when he comes to the surface, he sees uh, Jonah killing Rama. And because he has a body now, he can knock him over and he knocks him down into that same pit that Dead Man just fell down. And just like Dead Man, as he falls, he becomes ghost-like. But that makes the giant rig on his back, this gun, fall and crash to the rocks. Kind of interesting. That looks like Joe Kubert inks there. So I guess outside, Sensei basically takes control again. I mean, as far as his soldiers know, he was in control. They never saw this Jonah guy. He's a ghost. Oh, I'm sorry. They did in the city. But he convinces them, you know, like, yeah, follow me again, guys. So when Jonah crawls his way back up, Rama appears out of the darkness. I love this with her multiple hands clawing for him. That panel, too. That's a really cool image. Because, you know, she's the goddess of peace and love, basically, but... She, I guess when she gets mad, she's fucking scary. And she attacks uh, Jonah. And it says, equal yet opposite forces do not collide. They merge. They cancel each other out. They balance. She just dives right into him. And then the temple from outside, they see it. It starts to like implode up in, in upon itself. Almost like the house at the end of Poltergeist, you know? And Loomis runs in to find Dead Man. Man, another just perfect panel. I'm really trying to refrain, guys. I'm pointing out every panel. But some of them I can't contain myself. And so this giant vortex finishes up the temple. And all the snows flow into Nanda Parbat. It's not protected anymore from the elements. It's pretty much, it's over. The city's dead. And then Boston, dead man, dies once again <laughs> and turns into a ghost. So then the sensei starts taking off with all the soldiers. And uh, Loomis is like, wait, you can't leave us here. These All these kids, they're going to die of... Uh, from the, the cold. He's like, that's not my concern. And uh, just over this range, there's this giant uh, transport hovercraft. Me and my men are going to 
go and meet up with all the Nanda Parbatans and we're going to, they're going to do some bad things in the world. <laughs> they're going to fuck shit up, do some crimes. And, uh, Loomis is basically like, okay, kids, I guess this is it. And then all of a sudden, this giant hovercraft comes out of the sky. And the pilot, we see by the aura, he's it's Dead Man, who took him over. So he uh, he left those uh, Sensei and his soldiers all their ditch somewhere. They, they're probably going to freeze to death now. And he takes all the kids to safety. And... Uh, Dead man makes a vow to continue his fight against evil. Yada, yada, yada. Another beautiful joy of Rama. So that's it, guys. Dead man number one through four. I gotta say, not very good writing. This is a... Uh, not very uh, thrilling or... I don't know. But I, I'm going to keep it forever because this art is so beautiful. Usually comics that were like this kind of eh... Story-wise, I would just like, I don't know, sell them. So I'm like, yeah, it's pretty hard, but it's a shitty story. But over the years, I have learned that like, eh, sometimes it's just nice to keep some of these comics, even if the story's not that good. Because to be honest, having to reread this, it wasn't fun. It was kind of a chore. I was like, well, I got to read this to make a video. But, but it was beautiful to look at the art again. And so I basically consider this like a nice portfolio of Garcia Lopez art, you know? So uh, they stay in the Academy. I hope you guys could see this on a nice size TV. If you could see how beautiful this art was. It's some really nice stuff. And uh, unfortunately, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez drew a lot of goofy comics that I really don't want to own, like Atari Force and stuff. And uh, maybe I should, though, just have more of his art in my collection. So maybe I'll track those down in the dollar bins. But I hope you guys didn't like this, and I hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies.